first of all, thank you for accepting this paper to uh, this session. Uh, my contribution to the topics and discussions for debate today will take stance from medieval urban material culture. And in doing so, I will draw on archaeological materials from my own research as well as from medieval <coughs> art and written sources. My ambition with this presentation is not to present any final results or finished research, rather to take the opportunity to explore some initial thoughts on what a perspective of effect can bring to the studies of artifact assemblages and the mass materials of urban towns. <laughs> Popular views of medieval material culture in Sweden have been that of predominantly functionality and practicality. The Dark Ages have rarely been seen as a time of excess and abundance, leisure and pastime, with the possible uh, exception of the urban and feudal elites whose conspicuous consumption tournaments and palatial lifestyles have been rather suspiciously treated and seen as mimicking more elaborate and foreign continental European traditions. The artifacts from ordinary households and lower classes have in such a view rarely been considered to be ne neither amusing or fun, neither as expressing collective or personal social aspirations or political struggles. The view is further emphasized by scholarly literature, by the repeated referencing of the so-called superfluous laws that starts in the 13th century, that were regulating uh, behavior and proper appearance of the time. Many scholars also have referred to philosophical and religious texts, biased by maintaining an established structural and hierarchical order in medieval society, and also from bringing attention to later and post-Reformation Protestant worldviews, such as the mentionings in the so-called rational effect teachings of the 16th century. This is, I argue, however, a picture of a society in a stark contrast to the one that meets us in the many manuscripts, the marginal drawings, church murals, and the descriptions of the repeated festivities and carnivals of the period. In my soon-to-be-finished PhD project at Uppsala University, I investigate changes in urban material culture and transformations in social practices between the 12th century through to the 16th century, and I do it from three Swedish towns. Oh, sorry, this is new. should be there. <laughs> um, in doing so, I have examined and compared and classified more than 9,000 artifacts using multivariate analysis on complete assemblages of household materials. This is ranging from pottery shirts to dress accessories, uh, armor, uh, religious items, and much more. And I uh, have been doing so in search of a general picture of what daily life in the towns was like, and uh, how identities was affected by the large-scale changes in urban and political networks during the Middle Ages. My study thus focuses on consumption of material culture and the role of objects in the performance of the everyday social practices. Sorry. Uh, sometimes the objects in themselves carry messages that enable us to interpret them further than their mere practical and functional characteristics. Such is the case with these uh, so-called Romanesque bronze bowls, found in surprisingly large amounts in the towns of the region. Although clearly intended as objects of display and effect, the encoded messaging gives us many possible interpretations. These kinds of objects were up until the mid 20th century thought to be wash basins for hands, and they occur most frequently in the Baltic and Hanseatic towns and have uh, thus been seen as a part of a handsome material repertoire and customs associated with the merchant classes. In the 1970s, a large-scale research project uh, reinterpreted them on the basis of the many types of decorations on them to be used as mirror bowls, primarily used in nunneries for acts of penitence. Here you see a reconstruction of two fragments of the bowls from Uppsala, one with ornamentation and the other with ornaments interpreted as angels. This one. Um, the other fragment you see up here is from a very recent excavation in the town of Enköping nearby. Uh, and they're all contextually dated to the end of the 12th century to early 13th. Sorry. Uh, 
for you. Yeah, there. The ion chopping fragment bears fragments of a text, which is suburbia, meaning pride, and it's an imagery of a person looking into a mirror, belonging to a suit of vessels with so-called virtues and vice motifs. However, no nunneries are known, neither in Uppsala or in Chapping. And thanks to the recent research uh, that now has been done, we know, now have a third interpretation, that these bowls were used as pedagogical instruments in teaching about religious texts, including such as <coughs> the Virtues and Vice. And at first glance, these objects, at least the ones with Virtues and Vice, seems to fit the mold of a pious Christian moral present in the medieval objects. The main biological mimic artifacts are, however, both fragmented and discarded, which makes it harder to fully understand and recognize their original contexts or relational properties. It is therefore necessary to link these fragments by topology and analogy to existing museum examples, as well as contemporary art and written sources. Nevertheless, there are plenty of glimpses of laughter and leisure, amusing and unnecessary objects, without any immediately practical explanations. The examples here uh, are, among others, uh, the highly decorated redware jugs, uh, some of these with the quite famous dancing motifs, uh, and also the uh, small fra fragment of a so-called Kutrolf bottle, a bottle that when it's poured it's obviously something nice to look at, but it also makes a very specific sound when being poured. Uh, also, there is a widespread use of gaming and music objects such as Astragon gaming bones in almost all settings within the town. And as we already heard today, uh, dress and dress accessories, dress accessories is some of the most effective and powerful means of expressing social identity and cultural identity as well. Uh, although that research is well recognized in Sweden. Surprisingly little attention has been paid to it in Swedish archaeology. The field is dominated by uh, art history historians that use specifically mostly imaging and textile fragments from museum collections. Uh, sorry, I need to find that. There. <coughs> The high level of detail from the archaeological records thus remains underutilized in the exploration of dress and customs. We now know from the written records also that the so-called superfluous laws in the 13th century, that people also dressed outside of the norms because they had to pay a fine if they did, and using dress codes of wealthier classes threatening uh, the established social orders. But in some cases, art is the only thing we have to understand the, the, to give further insights to how seemingly ordinary objects could be manipulated to express character, moods and emotions that is impossible to reach from the archaeological materials alone. Here to the left, we see the com comical character and the fool of Markolfus depicted in a local parish church. Markolfus is known from many literary sources, as a profane and vulgar figure, underscored by the positioning of his belt bag and dagger. This can possibly also be transferred to the Jew salt layer in another church, uh, but here we have no text that explains how or why he is appearing this way. Uh, how this effect could be read from archaeological material alone is maybe something we could discuss later. Another comical and vulgar figure uh, from the medieval repertoire is the so-called Hans Wurst that featured in the many carnivals around Europe and still is today, but in a rather milder form. Here is depicted from a later 17th century German source. And this figure preferably shows him from, shows him, uh, as a well-fed member of the towns uh, were chosen to play the role in the carnival parades, dressed in sausage and surrounded by meat and wine an image of both greed and gluttony. So, 
The carnival depictions, such as in this famous painting, is a rich source for display of how ordinary objects, cauldrons, sausages, drinking vessels, was all turned upside down in the chaos of the festivities. It was also way well attested in later sources to question and critique the political and religious authorities by using humor as a weapon. For any contextually minded archaeologist, such as me, Investigating the material culture from this painting alone more resembles a nightmare scene from hell. <laughs> but also in the carnivals, there is an explicit message of piety and morality. Because in the end, the commercial and vulgar figure of Hans Wurst, seen here riding a barrel at the bottom, uh, is supposed to lose a, in a battle to the old and pious lady of Lent, restoring order and just ways of living again. You can see she's armed with two herrings. <laughs> <laughs> we have only begun to scratch the surface of this topic today, but hopefully I have managed in this presentation to show the variety of ways objects in the medieval world had possibilities to affect, and that there is much more to be explored uh, of the complexities involved in interpreting the performance of everyday lives. But in the end, the moral to this story is perhaps that we as archaeologists also have a responsibility of, with the narratives we choose because those narratives might actually have the most effect after all. Thank you. <laughs>